Hello! In this video, I'm going to show you how to make and interpret a Pareto chart in Excel. Now, if you haven't heard of them before, Pareto charts are used for determining where the source of a problem or even a success are in a visual way that often people can look at it and very quickly uh, tell what's going on. We'll have an example Pareto chart by the end of this video, though it's probably unlikely that you found my video and don't already know what a Pareto chart is. You probably know what it is and want to know how to make one. So let's jump right into that. Here in Excel, I have some example data. I should point out this is Excel 2019 in Microsoft 365, uh, Microsoft Office 365. So if you have that exact uh, version of Excel 2019, uh, you should be able to do this just like I'm doing. Uh, if you have an older version of Excel, your mileage may vary and you may have to Google a couple of things, but hopefully this will at least tell you what button names you're looking for and what words to Google if you don't have Excel 2019. In this made up example data, I have um, a work order number. So we're imagining that this is a company that maybe uh, repairs or delivers, let's say TVs and computers, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we have where their work order came from in terms of a district, who the tech was, again, made up, uh, what the service they did was, whether it was a rush order, and the number of techs it took. For the purposes of this video, let's assume that the company we work for has asked us to analyze uh, our sources of rush orders. Maybe these are the orders where we make the most money. And so places where we have a lot of rush orders, we want to hire more folks. Places where we don't have a lot of rush orders, maybe we want to increase our advertising, something like that. But the point is we want to know sort of by district what our rush orders look like. And one way to do this is with a Pareto chart. It helps you quickly visually see uh, where the real source is. So let's jump into that. Since I'm interested in rush, the first thing I'm going to do is make just a binary column, one or zero, was this a rush order? Now, I don't strictly need to do this, but there's one trick that I'm going to show you at the end of the video that I find helpful uh, that will only work if we turn this into a one or zero column. So I'm just going to make a column called rush binary. And here I'm going to use an Excel command called exact. So equals exact. And this just means I want two things to match exactly. Give me a true if they match and a false if they don't. First, I'm going to put in the text that I want to match. Yes, it doesn't really matter the order. And then in this case, I'm just planning it out for this row, and then I'll have Excel fill it all in later. I'm just going to click the Rush cell for this row, close my parentheses, and hit Enter. Now, I know exactly what happened because this happens to me all the time. It's telling me there is a problem with my formula. And I've gotten so used to seeing this. The problem is that Excel wants text in double quotes, not single quotes. So I'm going to hit OK, go back. Uh, I do this all the time. I forget which way it's supposed to be, and I just use uh, single quotes out of habit. So there we go. In this column, we do not have a yes. And that's the only thing that would return true. Now, remember I said I want this to be a 1 or 0. So there's one more piece to this. I'm going to do times 1 just to make sure it's doing exactly what I want. Now, Excel is smart enough to sum up trues uh, and know that a true should be a one, but I, I want to see it visually so I know exactly what's happening. I don't have to worry about whether Excel is being smart. Uh, a trick, uh, if you don't know it, I want to fill this in on every row where there's data. So just move your mouse until this uh, corner here turns the cursor into a very small plus sign. And then if I just double click, that'll fill in everywhere there's data. I can confirm that by going to the bottom of this column. To quickly go to the bottom, uh, hold down the control he key and hit the down arrow, and it'll move us all the way to the bottom. So we see that we have 1,001 rows. The first one was just headers. So we have 1,000 rows of data, 1,000 observations. And I can see that where there are yeses, I got a one in my rush binary column. And where there are not yeses, I got zero. That is the pre-processing we need to do, again, for the trick that I'm going to show you at the end of this video. Next, we're going to turn this into a pivot chart. Not a Pareto chart yet, but a pivot table, uh, not chart. So once I have this data pre-processed, I'm just going to click the square up here in the corner to select everything. And then I will say from the data tab, so I might have been you know, on home earlier, but if I click the data tab, I want to insert a pivot chart. And I am looking in the wrong place. We're going to click the Insert tab, and I'm going to insert a pivot table. 
Uh, for the purposes of this, since there's only this data in the sheet, if you maybe had a lot of data in your sheet, you might have to select exactly the area you want. But for me, it's fine to just select in the corner. Excel is saying, oh, you really just mean A through G, don't you? And the answer is yes. Let's put this in a new worksheet. And now we have what, uh, if you haven't used a pivot table, can be often an intimidating thing to look at. But it's going to be very simple what we want to do with this. So first off, remember I said that we want to know where our rushes are happening by district. So that by, by district, I'm going to drag whatever my by variable is into rows. And then the thing I'm interested in, the thing I made binary, into values. Okay, uh, now this looks promising. It's telling me sums of where these came from. And just to confirm, I look and it says sum. So that's right, sum of rush binary. Now I'm pretty much ready to make my Pareto chart. The only problem is Excel with certain types of charts will get mad at you if you try to make them right off a pivot table. So I'm going to do one more step that isn't always necessary, uh, but a good habit because I know for many charts, I'll have to do this. It's more frustrating to try to remember which ones than just to do it all the time. So I'm going to make this little place here that says district and a little place here that says rush. And all I'm going to do is say, I want this to be the same cell over here from the pivot table. An annoying thing about Excel is if I just click this and I change the table later, Excel will try to be smart and figure out exactly what I meant. So I know this seems silly, but instead I'm going to click somewhere else and drag my box over to the table on that cell. Again, and this is what I'm talking about. Excel is trying to help me. It's saying, oh, you really want to get data from a pivot. And if I change this pivot table later or change the sheet later, things can get messy. So instead of accepting this, I'm just going to click somewhere else and drag over to the table. And notice now it's giving me the cell reference instead of that complicated get pivot command. All right, now I'm ready. Now I only want to fill in the parts where I actually have data. So this time I'm going to do it manually. I'll click the little corner and drag down. And now I've got exactly the same thing. It seems silly, but if I change this uh, sheet or pivot table later, my data won't go all wonky. I can still recover uh, the table and the chart that I intended to make. Right now, ready to go to insert. I find the easiest way to do this is just to say recommended charts. And at least in Excel 2019, I know it's going to be the bottom one. But it looks like this. It has bar charts and then a line going across. Okay, it's in there. I'm going to make it bigger. And just because uh, I'm getting up there, I suppose, in my years, I'm going to up the font size, not that much, so that I can read it and expand things out just a little bit. You can see we can play with sizes, play with our labels. But here, insert an informative title, something like, Pareto chart or rush orders. Okay. I have my districts, I have my counts, and then over here, the key part of Pareto chart, percents that match up with this red line. What this is telling me is, and if I follow it across, about 22.5%. Oh, sorry. About 20. <laughs> easy to mess up there. Red line goes with the right side. So about. 45% of our rush orders come from the Northwest. And then if I look at these two together, just thinking about Northwest and Central, match up on the red line. So 60% of our rush orders come from the Northwest and Central. So this red line is a cumulative percent, and these bars are the counts where they're coming from. So you can right away see, okay, our biggest place with rush orders, maybe the place where we want to hire more techs to do more rush orders, Northwest. Uh, the place where we don't get them, maybe we want to do more advertising, northeast. Very quickly see what's going on, and you get an idea both by count and by percent. The reason this is called a Pareto chart is it's based on the Pareto principle, uh, which says 80% um, of your efforts are really wasted. 20% of your efforts are where 80% of your successes come from. Uh, so in this case, that idea would be 
the important portion of our customers for the purposes of this analysis are in the Northwest. So it wasn't 80% or it wasn't 20%, but if you wanted to fit into that idea, the important 20% is the Northwest. That's where a lot of our rush orders, a lot of our income is coming from. One interesting thing though, is this is always thinking about percents of totals. Another way to think about this is how many orders from the Northwest are rush? How many orders from Central are rush? And to do that, this is the trick where I said we really needed everything in a binary form, one and zero. So to do this trick and just follow along, I think you'll see the power of this. I'm just gonna highlight the entire pivot table I made, uh, hit Control C to copy, and then I'm gonna paste it somewhere else in here just under it for visual simplicity. Let's get rid of some of these extra boxes. And all I'm gonna do is change what these values are. So where I had some before, I'm gonna click this, value field settings, and I'm gonna change it to average. Which now, out of one of the nice consistencies of math, because I made these binary, those averages will be the percents of orders from that district that are rush. And if I wanna make this look like a percent, I can come up here, hit the percent button, and there we go. So this says 20%, 26% of orders from the Northwest were rush. 14% from the Southwest were rush. So let's see how that matches up to our of total orders. So remember about 45% of our total orders um, that are rush are from the Northwest, whereas 26% of the Northwest orders were rush. From the Northeast, very small percent uh, of our rush orders come from the Northeast. And that's a consistent story. But what I've seen before sometimes is these could almost be reversed. It could turn out that we have just very few customers in the Northeast, but they're all making rush orders. And we could have an absurd number of customers in the Northwest, and only a few are making rush orders. So sometimes it depends on the question you want to ask. Are you asking where do our rush orders come from? Or are you asking, what region really likes rush orders? That first question, where do our rush orders come from? The Pareto chart answers directly. It's just gonna be whatever was put first in your Pareto chart, because this is a nice automatic sorting. But that second question, where are rush orders popular, would be answered by the second table and the one with the highest percent. Now here, they turned out to be the same, but in my experience, that is often not the case. Hopefully from this video, you learned how to make a Pareto chart and a little bit about interpreting them. I really hope you enjoyed it, and thank you so much for watching.